everybody. I am happy that once again, you have chosen to join us in our Bible study. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, once again, we come to say thank you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Father, we ask as always that you would open our hearts and minds to receive your fresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are still on article number 11, the perseverance of saints. And our author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure until the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare <clears throat> and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. When I was a kid, I loved to play make-believe. It, it, was, it was always fun to just pretend that you were somebody else. You know, I love pretending to be the teacher and because, of course, that meant that I was the boss. And at times, we would uh, play dress up and pretend that we would be grown-ups or we would tie anything resembling a cape around our neck and jump off the porch and pretend to be Superman. So as kids playing pretend games, it was always easy to tell who you really were. Nobody had to wonder if you were uh, the pretend person. Nobody thought you were really Superman. But as grown-ups, we sometimes still play the pretend games. One of the big differences between pretending as a kid and pretending as a grown-up is that as a grown-up, it is not always easy to see who the real person is. And in our modern days, uh, we have all kinds of creative ways to disguise ourselves, making it hard to see the real person. Have you ever looked at some of those uh, YouTube videos uh, of women putting on makeup? I'm always just amazed at, at what they look like before the makeup versus the person afterwards. There is nothing, no facial flaw that they cannot make disappear. I mean, when, when they are finished, the person looks are flawless. And the amazing thing is, that nothing you see is real. It's all a cover hiding behind uh, the real person. And, and so it, it, it's, it's just a cover up. It's a pretend. And so Jesus says in Matthew 10 and 28, there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. Nicodemus was one such person. He was flawless on the outside, but messed up on the inside. A few lessons back, if you recall, uh, I had this nagging question that caused me to really ponder. Why, Nicodem why Nicodemus? Why a Pharisee? Why would Jesus give the, mo the most famous verse or one of the most famous verses in the Bible and, and, and a condensed version of the gospel to a pious Pharisee, uh, a ruler of the law? That question has nagged me on, on this scenic route. And finally, one morning, early morning, around 4 a.m., uh, the Holy Spirit woke me up and gave me the answer. And, you know, even though it was cold in the house and I didn't really want to get up, I didn't want to forget it either. So I didn't want to forget it. And, and so I got up and wrote it down. 
John the third chapter verses 1 and 2 says now there was a man of the Pharisee named Nicodemus a member of the Jewish ruling council he came to Jesus at night now look again at, at what we're told about Nicodemus first he was a man of the Pharisees second he was a member of the Jewish ruling council. And third, he was a man of the night. And when you look at that, all of those, all those things gave him a cover to hide behind. All those things kept the real person from showing. And Jesus, Jesus stripped him of all of his coverings and exposed the real man and, and showed him, showed Nicodemus that he too was in need of a savior. And, and so he too needed to be born again. And without new birth, he would not see nor enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was a mystery to Nicodemus, but Nicodemus was no mystery to Jesus. Jesus knew him well, and, and he knows us just as well. And yet, knowing us as he does, he still loves us. No matter the cover or the covers that we wear on a regular basis, Matthew 10 and 30 tells us that even the hairs on our head is numbered. Note that the hairs on our head are numbered, not counted. That they, they are numbered individually, like strand number one, strand number two, strand number three, and so forth. Each strand has a number. Even if you have no hair now, or if you have few hair or, or, or not as much hair as you used to have, God knows what used to be there and he knows what's there now and God saw the hair fall or he sees it when it fall every day we lose hair and, and you know I don't know if when strand number 15 fell if he replaced it with a new one or if uh or if new ones are given its own number i don't know how god counts it i don't know but i just know that the bible says that he knows god loves us and god love for us is so precious and so precise and detailed even down to the number hair of, of hair that we have on our head let that sink in for a minute in fact before those verses, Jesus had, he asked a rhetorical question. He, he says, are you not more value? Are you not of more value than many sparrows? Now, y'all, you know, I had to look up the actual worth of a sparrow. And surprisingly, it wasn't, it is not worth much at all. In Jesus' day, two sparrows were sold for a Roman penny. And it took two pennies to make a farthing. And a farthing was one sixty-fourth of a denarius. And a denarius was the average laborer's wage for one day. So a common laborer, daily wage would buy almost 130 sparrows, which means they were cheap. And in, in, in Jesus' day, the poorest of the poor brought sparrows to the temple for their offering. That puts Jesus' rhetorical question into perspective. It's like, are you not more value, more valuable than many sparrows? Y'all, I mean, 
when you think about it. That's like picking the lowest of the lows. That That is like trying to, you know, when somebody is just like, they just so messed up. And you want to try and say something good about them. And, and so you, in order to find something good to say, you literally have to dig deep into the gutter to find something to say that will, uh, you know, you, you would say stuff like, well, at least you're better than, and you fill in the blank. It, it, it would have been, think about it, it would have been great if Jesus had said, you are more valuable than gold or silver or pearls. But he didn't say any of that. He says, he says we, he compares us to sparrows. You are more value than sparrows. You, it's like when you make that comparison, there's no reason to stick your chest out. At, at, at least not on the surface, but hidden in this metaphor, comparing us with everyday, with the everyday most common, it, it, it's like when you dig deeper into that rhetorical question or the metaphor, it's really words of comfort. It's like when you think of all the millions and millions of people in the world and all the unconscionable sufferings that people have to endure. It's easy to think that you're just a speck in you you're just a speck in the number and that God is really not aware of you. That in the big scheme of things, your problems seem so minute that God does not even see you. And, and there are times when we all feel that way. Many of you might be feeling that way right now. Think about this. As of this recording, worldwide, there are 106,514,949 cases of COVID. That's people. And, and then worldwide, there are, at this recording, 2,323,928 deaths. That's people. And there are 78,155,668 people who have recovered from, from COVID. And so those numbers are, uh, uh, they're just astonishing. But when you say worldwide, it, it just sounds so far away. So let's bring it closer. There are 27,532,602 cases in the United States. So of that 106 million, 27 million of them are in the United States. And of that, 473,735 people have died in the United States. And that 17,000, 17,270,000 468 of those individuals living in the United States have recovered. When you think of it in terms of in the United States, that makes it more personable. And then when you compare the total U.S. cases to those who have recovered, that means that 10 million 262,000 
134 people are actively either dealing with COVID or dying from COVID. And, and if you are one of those people or have a loved one that is one of those people, you may feel like you don't matter. The comforting thought in this metaphor it is that you have value. They have value. Each one of us have value and worth. We are known and loved eternally by God. To us, we may seem like, one, like, like a sparrow, just one of millions going through this or that problem or situation. But to God, we are known by name and we have value. At times, we may feel like that sparrow, worth nothing. In those times, it's comforting to remember the value of even one sparrow, which may not be much in the marketplace, but by God's value system, it is most valuable. God knows us by name and in such and he knows us in such detail that the hairs on our head are numbered. He sees in us something so precious and and, and something of eternal value. The songwriter said, if he has to reach way down Jesus will pick you up. Jesus will pick you up if he has to reach way down. And so, but in Nicodemus' case, Jesus reached back into the Old Testament to a pivotal time in the history of Israel to reveal to Nicodemus how much God loved Israel. Think about it. When they had sinned greatly and deserved to die, and in fact, they were dying, their sin could have caused the whole camp to be wiped out. But God, in the midst of their utter helplessness, at just the right time, provided a remedy. Now, that remedy was only for Israel. It was only for those folk at that particular time. Even though the people kept the bronze snake, I can imagine they were probably hoping that it would keep healing them. It did not. Because it was only temporary. It was never meant to be permanent. They failed to see that the healing wasn't in the thing. And eventually, what had once been symbolic became an idol. And so the healing through faith at that time was just for Israel. And it was just for that time. But it was symbolic of what was to come. And so Jesus gives Nicodemus the Old Testament example. He, he gives him an Old Testament example that was only for Israel. But he uses it as a comparison to show what was to come. Not just for Israel, but for the whole world. Jesus said, for God so loved the world. And, and so again, my question, why Nicodemus? Here's the answer. It's because Nicodemus represented the world. R remember the lesson of the Valley of, of Dry Bones when God told Ezekiel to preach to those bones and that he, he said, son of man prophesied, preach to the bones. And God said that he would attach tendons to, to the bones and make flesh come on them and cover them with skin. And, and then he would breathe in them and they would come to life. 
So Ezekiel preached to the bones and then God said what he would do and what he, what he said would, he would do, he did. And, and then the bones came to life and, and they stood on their feet. And the Bible says that it was a vast army. Then God told Ezekiel, those bones are the whole house of Israel. And Nicodemus was symbolic of that army before the breath was put in them. He, he represented all those bones. He represented the nation of Israel. He was lifelike, but not alive. But when you take a deeper look, he also, he, he not only represented the nation of Israel, but he also represented the world without Jesus. Nicodemus represented or represents the rich in material things, uh, but lacking in spiritual things. He, he represents the pious those who are religious to a T, those who know the, who know the walk and, and talk the talk of religious folk, those who practice all things religious. He represents those who, who trust in their achievements, you know, their titles and their name recognitions. He represents the who's who of society and the who's who in our little world. He represents those who are empty, but can hide behind whatever mask they're wearing to hide the real person. Nicodemus represents the prejudice, those who think they're better than others. Remember Nicodemus was a Jew and, 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 and the Jews thought that they were better than the Gentiles. But even within his own race, Nicodemus felt that he was superior even to the other folk in the race, to the other Jews. Nicodemus represents the broken, the lonely, the needy. And finally, he represents the world that is walking in darkness. Matthew 4 and 16, the NIV version says, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Jesus here was, he, he had made his headquarters in Capernaum, in Galilee of the Gentiles. It, it was called Galilee of the Gentiles. And he made his headquarters there after John was put in prison. Now, it was called the Galilee of the Gentiles uh, because there was a mixed population there. Uh, and, 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 you know, Jews were marrying Gentiles. And, and, uh, and so there was a mixed population. And of course, uh, they were, that population was despised by what was those who considered themselves to be pure Jewish citizens. And, and so Jesus brought the light through his teachings and through his preachings and through his miracles. And as a result, Jesus' fame spread and he had great followings of people from many areas. In the Gospel of John, the first chapter, Verse four and five, speaking of Jesus, it says, in him was life, L-I-F-E, and that life was the light, L-I-G-H-T, of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. And, and so Nicodemus came with a covering of the night, but he was talking to the light. The light, who was Jesus, pulled back the covers of darkness, 
But the darkness, Nicodemus, couldn't understand it. Jesus said to Nicodemus, God so loved not only Israel, and, and, and God didn't just provide a remedy for Israel's sin, but God also loved the world. And to find out the rest of it, you got to come back next week. So, loved ones, we are, that's it for today. So be sure to join us next time as we continue to explore just how much the Father loves us. And with that, we're finished and goodbye. See you next time.